So today we're going to talk about antiderivatives. Um, the objective today is for us to be able to find the general antiderivatives of basic functions. I am going to show you some applications of it, so you will see some of those. Uh, we are going to look at the rules that we started to explore in the activity that we had done on antiderivatives. You'll start to see what the patterns uh, truly are, because we've got to go backwards, okay? So first off, um, let's just look at theorem number one. It says if f is an antiderivative of little f. Now, it is customary to use that the original function was uh, little f. Its antiderivative is big F. And if we're doing the antiderivative on an interval i, then the most general antiderivative of f on i is considered f of x plus c. Now, the c is an arbitrary constant because think about the fact that when we take a derivative, if there was a constant sitting there, it would become 0. So if we are looking at the antiderivative, we have no way of knowing whether or not there was a constant in the problem. So we include that c to remind us, hey, there could have been a constant there, but the constant canceled out. If we really wanted to uh, look and see if we were correct, we know that um, if we took the derivative of big F, we can check our work and we should get little f. Okay? Because going backwards is the antiderivative, checking our work is the derivative. So let's just look at two very simple examples. It says to find the most general antiderivative of each of the following. So what is the antiderivative of the function f, little f of x is sine of x? So we've taken the derivative, we've got sine of x. We want to know what function would have done that to begin with. So we know that the reverse of a sine is a cosine, but remember there is a negative 1 in front, so we do have to account for that. And so the answer is negative cosine of x. We can check our work very easily. The derivative of that is the negative times the negative sine of x or positive cosine of x, it checks out that is little f of x. So we should be able to, or I'm sorry, I wrote it wrong. I have it there, but I wrote it wrong. Um, so that should be little uh, f of x. If, uh, if it isn't, then you know, you know you've done something wrong when you've reversed the process. Let's do it again. So big F. For this one, now let's think about the rule, the power rule we learned when we were doing uh, derivatives. When we were doing derivatives, we learned to drop the power down in front, multiply it out in front, and then the power goes down by one. So you have to completely reverse that thinking. So the rule is now this time that the power goes up by one, and we have to divide off that original power. So that is our antiderivative for a power function. Now, let's check for a moment. Remember, n plus 1 is just a constant. If we did the derivative, n plus 1 would drop down in front. The n would go down by 1. And then there would be an n plus 1 in both locations. That could cancel out. And so it does check out that that is f of x. So it's a perfect match. So the antiderivative of a power function, the power goes up by 1 and you divide by that power. So let's look at some of our rules, okay? 
Here's the, our original functions. Here's their antiderivatives. Okay, let's just go down the list. If we have a constant inside of a function, the rule is the constant can just multiply by the antiderivative. You don't have to do any kind of weird sort of undoing a power rule or something like that, or I'm sorry, undoing a product rule or something like that. If you have two functions added together, you can just add their individual antiderivatives to find the derivative, antiderivative. The rule for power rule says that uh, to go backwards, the power needs to go up by one, and then you need to divide by that original power. The antiderivative for a cosine is a sine. The antiderivative for a sine is a negative cosine. The antiderivative for a secant squared is a tangent. And finally, the antiderivative of a secant tangent is a secant. So those are some of the most common antiderivatives that you're going to see. So now let's look at an example that's a little more difficult than the examples we've seen so far. So first thing, because that fractional part is divisible into all the other pieces, let's write our g prime as 4 times the sine of x plus 2x to the fourth minus x to the negative 1 half. So I'm just taking, you know how sometimes when we had done derivatives, we wanted it to be written in a certain way so things worked out nicer. Now we're going to take and just rewrite the function before we do the antiderivative. So I haven't done anything else but just rewritten the function using algebra to make it look a little nicer. Now let's um, practice taking the antiderivative. So we're going backwards. We're finding what was the original g function that did this. So this would be 4 times the antiderivative of the sine, which is the negative cosine. And then this is going to be 2 times the antiderivative of an x to the fourth. The power goes up by 1, and then we divide by that power. We're going to do the same technique in the next piece. The power goes up by 1, and then we divide by the power. And then for these problems, unless it's an application. Sometimes you don't need to do this, but most of the time we will be tacking on a arbitrary constant C that might have been there because we don't know. Oh, yeah, Maybe it could have been a 4 sitting there, a 2 sitting there, a 7 sitting there, a negative 1. We don't know that. <coughs> so the C kind of takes care of all of those cases of what might have been. Now, let's make this look a little prettier. So our final answer would be negative 4 cosine of x plus 2 fifths x to the fifth minus 2 x to the 1 half plus c. Now that's our g function. If we are correct, we should be able to check it by taking the derivative of g. Well, if we took the derivative, we get negative 4 times negative sine of x plus 2 fifths times 5, which is 2x to the 4th, minus 1 half times 2 is 1x to the negative 1 half, and then the c would go away. Well, if you look at my red rewritten problem, it is an exact match for what we see down in the bottom for the green one. Now, one of the most common applications for um, 
these problems is something called rectilinear motion. It's a, a, a physics type of comp, uh, ph physics type of idea. Um, and antiderivatives, um, those antiderivatives are used to analyze motion. Uh, we have explored uh, before um, that our position function s of t is um, the derivative. If you take the derivative of the, the position function, you get the velocity function. If you take the derivative of the velocity function, you get the acceleration function. Well, now for the first time, we can go backwards. If we know the acceleration, the antiderivative of it is the velocity, and then the antiderivative of it is the position. So all we need is the acceleration, and then we got it. Well, that's kind of what um, Newton found. He knew the acceleration of gravity, and by knowing that, he could then work backwards, find the velocity of items, and then actually find where is their position or what the position function would be for those items. So this is one of the first things that Newton uh, was trying to accomplish, and through uh, antiderivatives he was able to do that. Um, you're going to need the initial value, okay? Um, S sub zero is sometimes considered the constant, the constant for S. V sub zero is considered the C in the velocity equation. So for the first time, we might go backwards instead of forwards when dealing with motion of some sort. So we have just a few examples, just two examples we're going to go over today. So let's look at an example that deals with motion. It says a particle moves in a straight line and has acceleration given by a sub t is 6t plus 4. Its velocity, or initial velocity, is uh, negative 6 centimeters per second, and its initial displacement is 9 centimeters. Find its position function. So we know that a sub t is 6t plus 4. So big A sub t is the antiderivative. Going backwards is going to give us the velocity. So to go backwards for 6t plus 4 is pretty easy. You're just going to take 6t squared divided by 2 plus 4t divided by 1, which is still 4, uh, 40, plus the constant for velocity, which is technically our initial velocity. Okay? Now they told us that our initial velocity is negative 6. So now we know that our velocity equation is 3t squared plus 4t minus 6. Okay. So now we have our acceleration, I'm sorry, our velocity uh, formula. So now we need one more step. Let's get our position function. So the antiderivative of the velocity is the position. So it's going to be 3t cubed divided by 3 plus 4t squared divided by 2 minus 6t plus our constant, which is going to be the initial position, or s sub 0.
which they told us was 9. So that means our position function is t cubed plus 2t squared minus 6t plus 9. Minus 6t plus 9. Oh. Now, a way to check really fast if this is right, if I take the first derivative, I get 3t squared plus 4t minus 6. That should match our velocity equation, and it does. If I take the second derivative, that would be 6t plus 4, and that better match our acceleration formula, which it does. So you can check by, um, since we're taking antiderivatives, you can check your work by actually taking derivatives, and it should work out just fine for you. Let's do one last example. The problem says that an object near the surface of the Earth is subject to gravitational force that produces a downward acceleration denoted by g. For motion close to the ground, we assume that the g is constant and its value is 9.8 meters per second squared, or if you're using English units, 32 feet per second squared. So let's look at our example. It says a ball is thrown upward with a speed of 48 feet per second from the edge of a cliff that is 432 feet above the ground. Find its height above the ground t seconds later. When does it reach the maximum height and when does it hit the ground? So we have a lot to think about here. Now let's think about what we know for just a minute. The acceleration is the acceleration of gravity since they gave us information in the problem with feet per second, we're going to use the 32. If they used meters, we would use the 9.8. Now, it is pulling something downward, so that is a negative 32 feet per second squared. Okay? Now, let's think about what else they told us. They told us that the initial velocity is 48 and that the initial position is 432. Okay? So that's all the information they gave us. Um, we want to know when uh, it reaches its maximum height, uh, when its height, find its height above the ground t seconds later, that's the position function. So we need to know the position function. We need to know the maximum position, the maximum height, and then we want to know when is the position equal to zero. So that are all the things that they want to us to find. Okay. So first let's take our acceleration formula and let's go backwards to find the velocity. The velocity equation is the antiderivative of our acceleration. It is negative 32t plus our initial velocity, which is our constant right here, 48. Okay. Now we need to find our um, position function. Our position function is negative 32t squared divided by 2 plus 48t plus the initial position, which is 432 feet above the ground. So now we have our velocity equation, our position function, and our acceleration equation. Now, first off, they said, what is the position function? Bam, it's done. Next, they ask us to find the maximum. Well, you might recall that the maximum can occur 
at the zeros of the derivative of the function we are talking about. Well, here's the function we're trying to maximize. Its derivative is living right there. So we need to set its derivative equal to zero. So where is negative 32t plus 48 equal to zero? Well, that would be negative 32t equals negative 48, or t equals 3 halves, or 1.5. So at one and a half seconds, something is happening. Is it a maximum? Well, we can do the plus minus chart and figure it out, but think about it for a minute. That equation is an upside down parabola. Wouldn't the only point of interest be the vertex, the maximum? So it is a maximum, but if you really wanted to make a plus minus chart, now's the time to do it. They asked us, uh, when does it reach its maximum height? The answer is 1.5 seconds. If they said, what is the maximum height? You would stick 1.5 into the position function, and I will tell you I did that earlier, and it's 648 feet is the maximum height. The only other thing we haven't figured out is when does it hit the ground. Well, it hits the ground when its position is equal to zero. So when this position function equals zero. Well, that's negative 16t squared plus 48t plus 432 equals zero. Now, luckily for us, all of those pieces are divisible by negative 16 you get t squared minus 3t minus 27 equals 0. That is not factorable in the traditional sense. If you throw that into the quadratic formula, just trust me, you're going to get 3 plus or minus the square root of 47 over 2. Now, 3 minus the square root of 47, no, not 47, I'm sorry, I can't even read my own writing. It's uh, 117. I'm sorry about that. 117. Um, if you uh, added the square root of 117, you're fine. But if you subtract the square root of 117, you get a negative. And this is a time, so we don't want the negative time. So this is approximately 6.9 seconds. It will hit the ground. So you know, if you go backwards, we've answered, we've found the height equation. We found when it reaches a maximum, we found an extra little piece by finding what the maximum was, and then we found the time when it hits the ground. Any questions there? Yeah. Um, this assignment uh, is what goes with this lesson. So there's like these... 26 problems. So that is what I want you to do for uh, antiderivatives. There you go.